My name is Bill Garflink, and this is the series Careers and Development from USI, uh, CSIS. <laughs> yeah, whoop, get the right organization. And uh, with me today is Mike Hess. And I don't know if you've seen the blurb on Mike. He's had a rather varied career as a retired uh, Army colonel. He's worked as vice president of Citibank. He had handled Scandinavian accounts. The Nordics, yes. Yeah. And he was an assistant administrator in AID. Um, he taught at West Point and went to West Point. And so there's an interesting mix of development, military, and private sector uh, in his career. And he's going to talk about how those intersect uh, during his career and the changes that have happened over the past couple of decades. So with that, wow. Mike, over to, well, I could have said four decades, but I <laughs> didn't. So. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, CSIS, for inviting me. It's, thank you all for coming out on a uh, beautiful Tuesday morning. So, hope you enjoyed your breakfast out there. Yeah. Um, now I always like to start off and give a little advice to uh, to uh, people who want to get in this business or any business. I used to have when I was a banker. I had to recruit one year, and so I had to go out and uh, hire people to come be bankers. And so I'd like to give you a little, start off with a little advice, and that is never get a piercing that's going to show up in an interview. So just, just remember that. I'm not saying you shouldn't get them. I've got a few myself, but we're not going to uh, show those in public. But just a, a little advice on the, uh, on the career front, although I'm not sure that makes a difference when you're interviewing for development. Might even help you, who knows. Um, I'll talk about a couple of things, uh, give you a little background, how I got into this business, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about mentors and careers, but I want to mainly leave it open for you all to, uh, to ask some questions. When I talk about uh, my life, and my, my wife always reminds me of this, you know, in, when, when I look, at, look back over the years, there's only been a few places that I've made a difference in people's lives. One is I raised four children. Uh, I have those who Bill knows, my twins, because they were born while I was in office. Uh, I have 12-year-old twins, but I have two older young men who are actually one of them turned 40 last weekend. So I uh, raised four children, still working on the other two, and they are somewhat predict productive members of society. Uh, then I worked uh, in northern Iraq in 1991, and that's actually where I, I met Bill. Uh, I met a man named Fred Cooney, and we'll hear about him a little bit more later on. Uh, but we went into northern Iraq in 1991, Operation Provide Comfort, where the Kurds were dying at an extremely high rate. We were losing two to 300 children a day. And within a month, we had the death rate down below the national average. So it kind of made a difference in a few people's lives there, at least I think I did. Uh, and the team did, not so much me, but the team did. Uh, then Bosnia in 1995-96 went in the early days of the intervention there. Uh, and within a couple of months, we hadn't brought peace there, but at least we gave them a chance to work on it themselves, uh, as opposed to fighting and killing each other. And they had lost a lot of people in the last four years. Then I got to go to Kosovo uh, in 1999. I guess they thought I needed a little more work. And again, we were able to... Uh, bring some conflict mitigation and transformation and let the uh, Kosovars uh, work out for themselves. Um, I still teach a course on peacekeeping and conflict transformation, and we use the case study of Kosovo for that. And then finally, I got to go back to Iraq in 2003. I guess they thought I lost something there and needed to go back and look for it. Uh, but actually, General Garner, Jay Garner, asked me to come back and work for him, and I'd go anywhere for him. He's a, he was a great guy. So in 2003, I got to go back. You will notice in my career uh, that none of that had anything to do with banking. Uh, I never made a difference in much of anybody's life as a banker. Uh, but they all revolve around peacekeeping, conflict transformation, and development. And I like to think that Certainly, that's, uh, that's had a big impact on my life. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to mentors. But first, a little bit about how the world has changed. Obviously, in today's world, when, when, back in 1991, when we went in there, uh, we still talked about things like neutrality and neutrality for NGOs and how important it is and valuable and necessary. 
but obviously more and more in these days, we are working in conflict areas where people don't care about neutrality. Uh, the bad guys today look for soft targets uh, and they will go out and attack those and your neutrality isn't gonna protect you. And it certainly did for the NGOs at the time, but that has changed significantly. And how we operate in this day and age has changed dramatically. Um, certainly the civil military aspect of what we do has changed a lot. Uh, in 1991, I was serving with the military. I was in the army, uh, I was a civil affairs officer when we went into Northern Iraq. I couldn't spell NGO. I didn't know what the UN did. I didn't know what a DART was. Of course, the DART was just trying to figure out what it was too. But uh, obviously uh, that was one of the largest civil military operations we had had uh, since the Vietnam War and learning how to work together was very important and we worked pretty hard on it after that. So I think we, uh, we have to continue to work that. And the other thing that has changed is we no longer talk about just disaster relief and humanitarian assistance by itself. We try to connect it into the development sphere. Uh, and I know Fred Cooney taught me a long time ago that you know droughts don't cause disasters. Poor governance does. And Andrew Natsios, one of our mentors, uh, took that to a, a level where when we go in and fix the disaster, obviously you can't, you gotta stop the dying first, alleviate the suffering, but you ought to start rebuilding the institutions that will let the people uh, have the resiliency to fight off droughts and uh, hopefully they don't, they don't start killing themselves. I mean, if you look at a country like Zimbabwe today, which used to be the breadbasket of Southern Africa, and now they have to have 400,000 tons of food shipped in uh, for relief every year. Uh, they certainly have the capability to feed their people, but they can't. And so we have to think about that. So, Let's talk about some guiding principles and then we'll uh, open it up for your questions. Find a mentor. Uh, I had a number of mentors in my life uh, in the military, uh, some people like Michael Boyd. When I was, when I was uh, growing up, I had mentors. I was a cowboy when I was, uh, when I was a kid. My dad worked on ranches and managed ranches. Uh, so uh, I was very lucky to have a number of mentors there to include my father and a man who was a herdsman for the farm and his wife who, uh, who helped kind of raise me. Uh, but then when I got in the military, people like uh, Michael Boyd, who was one of our commanders, General Boyd, uh, had, was fortunate enough to work with a number of great people. But let's focus on Fred Cooney for a while. Uh, I met Fred in Northern Iraq in 91, uh, living in a tent uh, there. As I said, I knew nothing about this business. Uh, was totally ignorant, uh, and he was very patient and very kind, and uh, he probably had forgotten more about development than I will ever know. Uh, but some principles that he taught us about working together uh, to help save people and people's lives, but also the art of the possible. Uh, Fred was very much, we had lots of problems, uh, but he was not overwhelmed by those problems. He focused on the solutions to the problems, and the solutions had to be those of the people. He said, if we're gonna be successful at doing this, we have to make sure that they have the capability of doing it for themselves. And just a couple of little examples. When we were, uh, we first arrived in Northern Iraq and we were building the camps for the Kurds to come home out of the mountains. Do you guys know about I hate to ask where you were when, in 1991. It's always a very dangerous, dangerous kind of story. But the Kurds revolted against Saddam Hussein. They went, uh, he was much, he had much more capability left than they thought, and they forced him up into the mountains. And of course, he had not treated them well for the last 30 years, so uh, he had gassed them, and you know, it wasn't very nice to them. So he, they assumed he would do it again, and they went up into the mountains and were dying up there. And, pretty large numbers, mainly children under the age of five uh, were the largest number. And so Fred taught us how to focus on that. And as we were bringing them down to the mountains, out of the mountains into the camps, uh, he said, well, you know, I said, well, what are we gonna do about security? He says, Mike, we can never secure these camps. That's not our job. We don't know who the bad guys are, but they do. 
said. So they will, uh, they will set up a system of security. We'll watch it, we'll monitor it. Uh, and he was absolutely right. And I remember as we were bringing the first couple of loads of, uh, we flew down some of the men to help us build the camp. In fact, what he was trying to do was to show them that the area was secure and they could go back up and bring their families. Uh, and there were a bunch of press guys around uh, ABC, NBC, all the pools were there, CNN, as the helicopters came in, the Kurds got off the helicopters. And all of a sudden, uh, they started attacking this one translator for ABC News. Turned out he was an Iraqi secret police, but it just proved Fred's point, that we don't know who the bad guys are, they do. And they have to take care of themselves. Uh, he also taught, uh, I, I talk about, <laughs> I always attribute that quote about Fred and the drought to, uh, to Fred. It was who Fred was. Okay, Fred, <laughs> there, there's a great movie called The Lost Americans done by uh, PBS. Um, a great show. Interestingly enough, you can't find it online. I had to go, I had a, I had a VHS. Do you know what a VHS tape is? Yeah. I turned it into a, a DVD. But Fred was... Uh, we thought he was a, a, a former Marine pilot. Uh, that's the story we kind of got, who graduated from Texas A&M. Uh, he did not graduate from Texas A&M. He was a pilot, he got his own license, and he flew around. Uh, and he ended up graduating from Rice, I think it was Rice, Rice University in uh, city planning. And he, got, he flew down uh, to an earthquake in Guatemala. Uh, early on in his life. And what he noticed, he flew down on his own. He just got on a plane when the earthquake happened, decided he was gonna go down and help, and he shows up. He was, he was a huge man. He was six, five, six, six. Uh, so he, he, was, he was a very impressive figure, if you will. Uh, but he, had, he started looking and how do you fix things in a disaster like this? And he noticed a couple of things right away. One, you gotta use the locals and empower them and put them to work. Don't just come in with the international NGOs and try to do it for them. Empower them, let them uh, do the work themselves because what you're doing is then putting them back to the work and then they have ownership um, very uh, much more quickly. And we could talk about that if you look at, for example, what OTI did during the earthquakes in Haiti in 2010. Within 24 hours, they were hiring young men to remove rubble. Um, in Port-au-Prince. They could have done it a lot faster with big earth movers and stuff like that. But, it, but the thought was, no, put them to work. A, you get young unemployed males off the street. You actually give them a little bit of money to go out and do some work and help their own, uh, help their own communities along and they get a sense of worth and value out of that. So it was a very good principle. But he also recognized very early on that it is the poor, poorest countries, the poorest parts of the countries uh, that are hurt. And that's where the city planning bit came in. They could have done a lot more uh, to improve the conditions in those parts of the, uh, the countries, but they didn't. And the governments uh, weren't taking care of their people well enough. And so he, he did a lot on organizing communities to take care of themselves and rebuild. He also figured out, especially in those early days, that the governments didn't necessarily appreciate that. Uh, and in Guatemala, when he was organizing, this is actually what you're talking about, is the developments of grassroots democracy organizations. And that kind of backfired on him a little bit. But then Fred went off and he flew uh, relief operations into Biafra. He did a lot of work in Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea. He was, you know more of them than I did. And then, uh, during, uh, during the Gulf War, he worked first uh, for USAID, uh, taking care of the Palestinians in Kuwait when the uh, military went back in. Uh, there was a lot of reprisal happening against the Palestinians, and uh, he figured out some conflict mitigation on that. He and Andrew did some great work there, and then he was chief of staff for the DART that went into uh, Turkey and later into Iraq. And Bill ended up, uh, Dayton Maxwell was the first DART team chief, and uh, Bill came in to replace him in 91. So Fred, great humanitarian, uh, great Texan, uh, 
Um, his, his works are now down at Texas A&M in the library there, uh, but just a great guy who taught a lot of us. And we would sit around, he was killed in Chechnya in 1995, and when we went into Iraq, or in uh, Bosnia in 95, 96, we would often be sitting around at night and say, what would Fred do here? Uh, and we would think about the art of the possible and how he, he came up with creative solutions to, to help people in those parts of the world. So, uh, Fred, we miss you. Uh, every testimony I did on the Hill, I would always put something in there about Fred. I still try to. Uh, I don't get to testify as much, though, but anyway. Uh, next thing, take risks. Uh, if you don't, you know, many times in, in these operations, you think, why me? Should I be doing this stuff? Take the risk, take the chance. Uh, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Uh, that, uh, that seems like a little bit of heresy for somebody who's spent over 30 years in the military, uh, but you gotta be able to take that. I mean, make sure the risk is calculated, and not something stupid, but you know, uh, if you go around a bureaucracy and you ask for permission, you will always find those who are gonna tell you no, so why bother? You know, just you'll find somebody who will agree with you eventually. And so get out there, take the risks and do it. Uh, I talk about perpetual optimism. Uh, I think it's extremely important especially uh, in, in these situations where things are pretty dire. Uh, most of the disaster relief operations you're gonna become involved in or you see are not uh, very nice places. Uh, and the optimism is infectious, it's contagious. And so if you can keep a positive attitude during these times, and they're not fun times, uh, you're, the folks that, with whom you work uh, will take on that air as well and, and keep that positive attitude and you'll be surprised how quickly it spreads. It's not easy. You gotta remind yourself every once in a while that things really are peachy. And then have fun, look for balance in life. Uh, it's not easy when you, when you look at your families. Uh, I look at my older boys now and they certainly, uh, I was gone a lot. Uh, when they were growing up in their formative years. Uh, and they remind me of that occasionally from time to time. So I try to do it a little bit different with the younger twins. They, if you go ask the boys, they'll tell you that uh, the younger twins had a heck of a lot easier than the older ones did. Uh, but try to find that balance. You won't, you will not, you, uh, you will fail at that. But just if you check yourself every once in a while uh, and say, okay, uh, maybe I ought to rate it back a little bit, or maybe I don't go on this mission. But also take care of your folks. Um, you, when, when you're on these operations, you will find that there are people who are stressed out more than others. And you need to be able to recognize that because they don't and they won't. Uh, and we instituted a program when uh, we were at AID uh, called the CARE program where we started sending people who were going to too many of these operations uh, and seeing a lot of bad things, make sure that they get some help uh, when they return. Because, and I'll tell you this story, when I came back from Bosnia, they gave us a psych evaluation and I failed it uh, because of the things that you had seen and done. Uh, and I remember I, you know, they gave you a little sheet and I actually filled it out honestly and this little private was adding up the score and the score didn't come up very high and he looked up at me and he looked down at the score and he tried to move the score sheet. It was a little bubble sheet. And he added up again and he looked up at me and then he moved it the other way trying to add up the score. Score didn't make it and he, then he finally said, sir, can you go sit in the corner? And so I went over and I sat in the corner. <laughs> it was. So I went over and sat in the corner. Finally, this guy comes out about 10 or 15 minutes later. He was a captain. And he says, oh, well, you know, we get a lot of false positives. But we'll send this thing off to be evaluated and blah, blah, blah. And you go, okay. And they let me go. And I went off. And three days later, I was back being a banker at Citibank. And uh, nobody ever followed up on that. That's not good. It's not good for your people. It's not, it wasn't, certainly wasn't good for me. Uh, I was sitting there and this guy calls me up and he says, you've got to arrange this lunch with this guy. This is the most important thing you can do. And I'm thinking, really? 
You know, there's places in the world where people don't even get to have lunch. So how important can this be? So the perspective and taking care of your people and making sure and taking care of yourself is, is pretty important. So I'll leave it there and uh, give you all a chance to ask some questions. Bill, I'm sure, has many he wants to <laughs> Let me start with one. If you think of what you'd like to ask, please, when you do, state your name and what you do, where you're from or where you're... Uh, working or in school or whatever that's going on, so he knows who, who he's oh. talking to. Could you spend a few minutes, you are the assistant administrator for uh, one of AIDS bureaus, uh, Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, which managed all the humanitarian, um, it, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, the Office of Food for Peace, the Democracy Office, the Office of Transition Initiatives, and several others. And just talk a little bit about how that worked. Well, and some of the things that were, were important to you uh, in that role. Sure. And, and I forgot to mention, and I, I failed to do this, but it's the best job I ever had in my life. So, and I owe that to Bill. Uh, thanks to Bill and Andrew Nazios, who gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, it was interesting at the time, because you look at it and you say, okay, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, that kind of makes sense. Uh, at the time in 1995, 90, or no, 2005, 2006, we were looking at fragile states policy because we'd come out of uh, the attacks on this country in, in 2001 on September 11th. And, and we looked at that and said uh, the national security strategy changed drastically in 2002 when it was re rewritten. And what do you think the biggest threat was to the United States in 2001? I used to teach history after lunch, so I can wait here and ask questions. What do you think the biggest threat was? Go ahead and guess. Bubba? Go ahead. It's okay. They can't hear you. Yeah. Al Qaeda, okay. The economy, okay. It was fragile states. What they looked at it was, where did Al-Qaeda train? Where, did, where were they allowed to form and, and, uh, and, and do their training and do the, uh, plan the attacks? It was in fragile states. And so the theory was, and, and they worked on it very closely, was if you took a fragile state and it became a failed state, then you would have to intervene a lot more drastically. If you could intervene quicker, when they were fragile and prevent them from becoming a failed state, then you would be able to do it a lot more. Uh, you could save a lot of resources doing it. So there was a lot of work happening at USAID and in development and around the world looking at this phenomenon. Okay, let's try and intervene quicker. And so people like Andrew had formed, taken the Humanitarian Bureau, Food for Peace, OTI. Andrew Natsios was the former head of AID. Yes. They didn't know that either? Okay, maybe not, okay. He was, he was the head of AID, great guy, uh, now at the Texas A&M College Station. But anyway, so if you could take that and say, okay, let's form a bureau, not just uh, when I mentioned going in to stop the dying and alleviate the suffering, that's very important, but let's look at the underlying causes of those disasters. Why wasn't the government able to take care of its own people? Why did the, the people not have the resiliency to respond themselves better uh, to the crisis? Sometimes they don't, but sometimes they could if they were better prepared. And so can we mitigate some of the challenges of the disaster early on? And he formed the Office of Civil uh, Conflict Management and Mitigation. Uh, the Democracy Office was brought in there so that we could take a holistic approach uh, to a disaster and disaster mitigation and disaster prevention. So it was a, it was a great opportunity. You, then we formed uh, the Office of Military Affairs so that we, we uh, USAID had worked with the military for generations. I mean, you can go back to the CORDS program in Vietnam, uh, but we had never had a centralized approach to doing it. Uh, 
so we decided to form the Office of Military Affairs where we could actually develop policy, civil military policy on how we would work and give guidance to those folks in the field so they didn't have to just make it up every time. And also have a more a one-stop shop for the military because obviously when you work with the military in the Pentagon and places like that, they want to work with AID, but they don't know how. I mean, they can't spell it. And so it would be easier if they could have a one-stop shop, and so the Office of Military Affairs. So the Bureau became pretty large in terms of uh, nine or 10 offices, I think. But it, it was a great place to bring all of those aspects of how you go from a disaster response, you transition, and then prepare it for development. And uh, one of the things that Bill and uh, the team had done is when we went into a disaster, we would form a working group with the regional bureau so that that handoff could happen a lot easier as well. And so it was, it was a great place to work. They're outstanding people. Some of the, you know, this is all about people. And I worked with some great folks in the Army. I was great, honored, and privileged to serve with a bunch of folks. But the people at USAID uh, and in the development world and our implementing partners around the world and the, and the countries where we worked were outstanding. So it was a great place to work. So that's Dacha. Yes. Any questions? Oh, Caroline's got a question. Um, oh. I feel so official. Um, Caroline Bisk, I'm an attorney from Seattle working on free trade issues here in DC. Um, you mentioned the importance of addressing failing states before they become failed states. There are a number of both of those in the world right now and a number of catastrophes that are sort of underway and continuing. Where do you think we should be focusing our resources now? Because we probably can't address all of these issues all at the same time. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Sure. Uh, that's, a very, that's a very key question. Um, we gotta try to keep this unclassified. Uh, if, you, if you look, the, there is a list of, of fragile and failed states. Interestingly enough, at the time, in, in 2005, 2006, uh, when, when the strategy was being developed, they actually named states. And uh, Andrew Natsios, former administrator of USAID, caught a lot of grief from some of these countries because they say, how could you call my state a fragile state? Uh, we've come a long way, uh, and, uh, and if you look where we were in 2010, 2012, nations were finally saying and signing up and saying, okay, yeah, let, let's be honest here, we, we could use uh, some help in moving up in the spectrum, <clears throat> and the Poussin Accords uh, did a lot to do with that. Uh, but let's say for sake of numbers, there are 50 fragile states in the world, 50. Uh, the problem is, can, can the US and its partners help all of those? No, they cannot. So what you have to do is then look at it and say, okay, where are the 10 or 15 most uh, likely to fail? That's a tricky assessment. Uh, and where can we have the largest impact? Uh, that's talking about prioritization, and it's an extremely important thing that you have to do in this business, is then you gotta figure out who we're gonna try to help and who we're not. In some cases, it depends on the country. Do they want the assistance? Are they gonna reform and try to uh, change it so they can help their people better? Uh, that's gotta factor in there. But also working with our partners. Uh, we used to have meetings with uh, DFID and uh, of the Department for International Development in the United Kingdom, DFID, and ECHO uh, in the EU, we would meet with them every six months. And we would try to project where we would see problems coming. And we knew we all couldn't cover them all, so we would make decisions. Okay, you guys take the lead in Zimbabwe, we'll take the lead in Darfur. Uh, and that way you tried to balance it out a little bit. But through the coordination efforts, through the prioritization efforts, then you could look at the most critical ones and try to head them off. I mean, 
the classic example is how many, how many people do you think go to bed, and then there's this is an official number from FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization. How many people go to bed hungry every night in the world? Just as a guess. Take a guess. They can't hear you because you don't have the microphone now. Half a billion. I got half a billion. 500 million. Anybody else? Three billion. Okay. That's pretty, yeah, it's pretty high. Any, oh, you're shaking your head over there. You got a guess? 20 billion. Oh, three billion. Okay. It's about 784 million people. That's what FAO said in their report in 2016. Uh, it's probably going up a little bit. I think it's about 800 and 815 now, so it's going up a little bit more. But still, it's a lot of people go to bed hungry every night. How many of those people do you think the international community can help feed out of that 815 million every year? Just a guess. Give me a percentage. 100%, 40%, what? I got 10%. 20%. 25%. Okay, it's about 10%. On a good year, the international community can feed about 90, 97 million, maybe. A, you know, so I'm not very good at math, but it's a little over 10, 15%. Not very many. So people have to make hard decisions every day on where that food's going to go, where that food aid is going to go. That's tough, okay? Uh, but those, by doing that, by going through that process and by working together, you can hopefully figure out who are the most needy and try to help them. Same thing in the fragile states. Uh, do they have the capacity? Do they want it? Uh, and can you really help them and turn that thing around? Developments uh, in fragile states at the moment is a couple of years ago, the fragile states got organized themselves. Yes. Well, there's a G7 with a big G and a seven, and there's a little G and a seven. And that's fragile states. And it's, uh, East Timor has taken the lead in that, uh, and they run the secretariat. And a country I know well, Congo, has listed itself, or, or the Democratic Republic of Congo has listed itself as a fragile state, and it plays a big role. And so there's about 15 or 20 states who acknowledge that they got real problems. Their governance problems, their corruption problems, they're all of these sorts of things. And fragile states have to be treated differently from other kinds of problems. Because you have huge uh, governance problems uh, that you have to really focus on if you want to make a difference. Justice becomes very important to make a difference in fragile states. So this group has gotten together with the various UN agencies and are working together to address their problems in a way that uh, the UN has never addressed them before. It's a good, it's a good thing that's underway there. They kind of operate under the radar screen. You don't hear them about them too much, but they do good work if you check them out and their, their documents on, on their website. And uh, they're, they're doing some very interesting stuff that uh, doesn't really get the attention it should. Somebody else? Hi, uh, uh, my name is Darsh Shah, and I'm uh, an intern with the UN Foundation. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, you've made a career out of conflict negotiate, you know, conflict management and de-escalating conflicts, both as a banker, I'm assuming, and as in international development. Um, what have you, what, what approach do you usually take in, you know, in de-escalating conflicts, especially in places, you know, in these places where, uh, there's animosity that goes back generations and uh, you know, religious and cultural factors that also come into play. I would like to think I didn't cause a whole lot of conflict as a banker, but you know, uh, try to resolve a few of those too. The, um, you know, it's interesting when you, when, you, when you look at it, what do you have to do? And we look at, at, at four aspects uh, of a conflict, one security, Two is the political aspect of it, then the political economy uh, of it, and then rule of law. So we look at all four factors, uh, and you've got to look at them simultaneously. Now, do they proceed uh, equally as fast? No, they don't. They're not, they're not going to. Uh, when we plan for these operations, uh, we now look at them as lines of effort. Uh, but first, you've got to separate the warring factions 
uh, and try to get them to disarm. It's not going to happen. Uh, we've worked a lot of DDR disarmament, uh, demobilization, and reintegration programs over the years. Uh, I've failed at many of them, uh, but you got to try. Uh, because when people are scared and they're afraid, uh, they are not going to disarm. Uh, we've tried it in a number of countries, uh, and it doesn't work very well. But you've got to try, and, and you've got to go through the effort and make it part of the rule of law and get them used to the idea that resolving conflicts through uh, fighting is not the answer, that they're you got to build the institutions to, to resolve the conflicts peacefully themselves. But you got to try. So you'll do, and you will demobilize, try to demobilize the warring factions. Uh, in Kosovo, we were dealing with the Uchika, the KLA, Kosovo Liberation Army. Uh, we transformed them into the Kosovo Protection Corps within 90 days and gave them a new uh, mission if you will. They were also disarmed. We still found weapons caches out in the countryside because they never, they always thought somebody was going to come back. Um, we also had to look at what were the drivers of conflict. You'll see a lot of that work done now. CMM did does some really good work on understanding what the drivers of conflict are. Uh, and then trying to address those drivers of conflict and look at your programming so that it addresses those and mitigate those causes, the underlying causes uh, for the drivers of conflict. Not just doing good for the sake of doing good, but look at those drivers of conflict. Um, that's more on the political, than on the political side, how do you bring the former warring factions from fighting each other to actually talking about solutions to their problems and giving them a political voice and giving them an institution in which they feel they can actually address those root causes and then move forward together. Not easy, we could use it in this country uh, a lot. The political econ people don't, they often ignore that and they do it at their peril because if people don't have jobs, um, and, they, and remember in most of these fragile and failing states, uh, the economy is run by the black market or the gray market. And the reason many of these leaders, Milosevic, uh, Karadzic, stay in power is so they can make money. Uh, it costs Milosevic $1.2 billion a year to stay in power. That's a lot of money that he had to steal from people. Okay, So what you want to do is to transform that into a real economy where uh, people will see that peace pays. Okay, they can have jobs, they can have meaningful relationships and, and rebuild their country. And then of course, rule of law because that underpins it all. Now, those are all gonna proceed at different paces, but you've gotta separate the warring factions first, that's the security aspect, uh, begin to disarm those uh, and demobilize those warring factions, and then hopefully find them work. It's interesting that the only, one of the best examples of a DDR program I saw was in Colombia, uh, that OTI, the Office of Transition Initiatives, uh, Rob Jenkins and his team were running in Colombia, and they were able to disarm uh, not only the FARC, but also the drug cartels, uh, and one of the things that I go, why is this working so well? You know, I'm not a very bright guy. I go, why is this working so well? And do they have an economy. You know, oftentimes when we do these programs, we give them a skill, but there's no place for them to go to work. You know, but in Colombia, these people could actually go off, we could teach them a skill, and they could actually go out and get a job. And, and maybe sustain, pretty articulate too, huh? Sustain themselves. And, uh, and help their families. Um, we went to this one site where they were producing things and we, you know, they always take you to the, the showroom and show you what they produced and made and you buy a few things. And I said, well, where, do you, where, where are you marketing this stuff? They were selling to DKNY, Ralph Lauren and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That I submit to you is a meaningful job to give some people. So those four things, security, political, Paul Econ, political economy, and rule of law.
Good morning. Thanks, Mr. Hess. Ambassador Grelvnik. I have a question. Uh, my name is Joe Garowski. I've done a few different contracts with USAID. Uh, can we talk about current state of the budget moving forward with the priorities of the administration? Maybe guesses on what outlooks would be for what priorities they are going to focus on. It would be private sector. Is it going to be more economic development, move away from whatever different focuses there are today, because there are organizations out there that definitely have uncertainty. Um, and, uh, there's obviously the reorganization that Secretary Tillerson's looking at at state, and I've heard, you know, focusing down to USAID reorg, maybe the different functional bureaus and the regional bureaus, and just what skills, I guess, would they be looking for project management? Uh, things down the line like that. Thanks. Probably not looking for folks in environment. <laughs> <laughs> Would not go looking for a job in EPA right now. I have some friends working there and it's, it's, a, it's a sticky wicket as the British would say. Um, it's interesting because I've done some consulting on this and so it, it, everybody, uh, there is certainly some, some uh, ambiguity uh, and some uncertainty uh, in the situation. But I try to tell people to relax. You know, uh, the good thing about, uh, one of the great things about this country uh, is that we do have a balance of power. You know, and while the administration may talk about uh, cutting foreign assistance by one third, you really have to look at those numbers and see what they actually mean. And oh, by the way, they can propose as they want but who has the authority to appropriate funds? The Congress does. Congress works very hard at that. Um, I, will, I will applaud USAID because they spend a great deal of time and effort working with the Hill and telling them what can be achieved uh, in their programs. And I, I think they've worked very hard on building those relationships. Uh, and so the Congress knows uh, what they get out of foreign assistance. The, the, and, the, and the challenge is there is not, a, is not an easy one because what does the average American think we spend at a percentage wise out of our budget on foreign assistance? 30%. When I came into office, it was 25%. It's now up to 30%. So the average American thinks we spend 30% of our budget on foreign assistance. What do we actually spend? Uh, about one, 1.5. <laughs> it's going to change, obviously, this year. But, you know, the reality is starkly different than, than what the perception is. And so I think people need to address that issue. And what do we get for that? I, I had a senator who was on the Appropriations Committee, and he used to tell me, Mike, I have the worst job in town. And I said, come on, you're killing me, Senator. You know, this is the most important thing in the world. You're helping people. And he says, no, he says, look at it. The perception is we spend way too much money on it, so we need to cut it. And two, how many jobs do I bring home to my constituency? Not very many out of foreign assistance, okay? So it's a tough thing to sell, but we, we in our development community and the foreign assistance community need to tell that story. And we do a poor job of it, a very poor job of it to the American people. And they don't. I mean, how many people, you walk out on the street today and ask somebody where Darfur is, and who keeps, who sends most of the food aid to Darfur? You know, they're gonna give you the penguin salute. I don't know. They don't even know where Darfur is. So it's a tough, it's a tough business. But we have done a good job, USAID in particular, of articulating to the people on the Hill, the committees in particular, about how foreign assistance helps. Uh, and I think we have also tied it better to the national security strategy. I mean, when we changed the national security, security strategy in 2002 and made development one of the three Ds, uh, defense, diplomacy, and development, to take a whole of government approach uh, to these problems, there is a recognition now that that helps in that process. If we can save those failed states or fragile states from becoming failed states, then it certainly helps in the national security effort. Uh, and so, Congress understands that very well. And that's why you're seeing the pushback right now in this debate on the Hill. And I think that will, that will, that will continue. 
I, I think the leadership, uh, Mark Green is a great administrator. Uh, he knows this business. Uh, that's encouraging. Uh, he understands the importance of development. Uh, he also understands the importance of building democracies, and that's part of it. I think that was, was always a threat to it. But I think more importantly, it's, it's the Congress and his leadership will help us address those issues. Uh, is it going to be a, a challenge? You bet your sweet bippy. Uh, but if I were looking at, uh, at a future, that's a technical term, by the way. Uh, if I were looking at the future, certainly the disaster response is not going to go away. Humanitarian assistance, I think we're seeing a lot more on the resiliency, building resiliency. Uh, building the capacity in governments to do with it themselves. I mean, that sells very well. Um, and obviously public health and where we're going on those programs are gonna continue to flourish because of the support from the Congress. If I could just add a, a couple of points. Um, I'm maybe a little more skeptical than Mike is a bit. I think the 30% budget cut is, is unrealistic, but uh, there's probably going to be a 10, 12 percent cut, um, which will have a rather dramatic impact, uh, and maybe not so much in AID itself, but on the United Nations, uh, which is an outfit we count on and, and is very important and does great work. Um, they'll be selective, uh, which where they'll cut the money out of the United Nations, it'll probably stay with peacekeeping. Uh, World Food Program, UNHCR, will probably do fairly well. Uh, some of the lesser known UN agencies uh, will suffer and our overall contribution to the UN will go down. And we'll quibble about that uh, with the Europeans quite a bit. The, the, to me, the, the troubling um, factor, and Tillerson, I think, is one of the uh, secretaries actually doing this. And I, I don't know budgets real well, uh, no, I had to deal with them for <laughs> ever an AID in the State Department. But you told me you did. I did, I did, but I don't. <laughs> but the budget gurus have all pointed out, as you say, Congress appoints money, the executive branch doesn't have to spend it. And if the head of OMB, who is not high on my list, um, goes to the various secretaries and say, you're gonna follow the president's wishes, not the Congress, um, that's a problem. And it will get into a legislative problem down the line. But I think it seems like Tillerson is paying more attention to that instruction than a lot of other people. And I think Mike's right. The humanitarian side of things um, will do fine. There's been a push, if you know, food aid to say, okay, let's, let's get rid of all food aid, uh, let's convert it to cash and keep the same amount of money, but it's cash. We don't send food and get USDA out of, the biz out of the business. That would be the worst thing that could happen. The one, one of the strongest lobbies in this country is the shipping li lobby and the food lobby. That keeps Food for Peace from AID alive. AID doesn't. And if you would exclude the Department of Agriculture from any involvement in food aid, it would disappear in a year. It would be gone. Yep. And that money, uh, like any program will get sucked up into other kinds of emergency responses that will not be used for food. So we'll cut out that program that, so it's really dumb. We've got to be very careful when we talk about reorganizing. I know there's some friends of mine in the Center for Global Development are very big, get USDA out of the business. That is a terrible thing to do and every senator and congressman will tell you that. Uh, you don't want them divorced from the development business, the food aid business, because it will suffer radically. So there's gonna, we're gonna suffer a bit with oh. this crazy uh, administration, and, uh, but not as bad as what it appears, but there's gonna be pockets of problems that we're gonna have to figure out over the next year or so, if they ever get to budgets, sure. um, which they may not. We're under, I can see, continuing resolutions for most of the next year or two, because it solves a lot of problems. You don't have to vote on a budget then. Um, and you pass continuing resolutions by voice vote, not by casting a ballot. So you don't never know who's voting for them or against them. So it's much easier to do a continuing resolution than actually pass a, a, a budget. Yeah. <laughs> In the back. 
Hi, uh, I'm Samira Daniels. I'm um, a dilettant to the development world, but I have followed it through uh, some of the work at the Center for Global Development. And this is a follow-up on, on, on the comments you just made. Um, you know, at various points, there have been theoreticians, you know, uh, economists or development experts, and I wondered who who is uh, contributing the kind of theory to uh, all this, because I think that that is, you know, sort of, it, we get so embroiled in the thick of things, so yeah. I was wondering what you could answer that. Well, I, I don't really have an answer for it, I, I, but it's an interesting question, and I think what you see, because I've we've both been involved in the study that was done here uh, on uh, reorganization of the State Department and AID that came out a month or so ago, and I've done a lot of work with the Atlantic Council and some others who have their own views on all of this, and it's interesting if the people working on the document, writing the paper, are development folks, you get one perspective. If they're humanitarian folks, you get a second perspective, and if they're particularly focused on food aid, you get a third perspective. And the folks who, um, it is a, an open question. If you go back to the pre-Clinton uh, days, foreign assistance was pretty much focused, centered in USAID. And uh, they had the vast majority of, of any kind of international assistance would run through AID one way or another. Now you've got about 20 to 25, 30 government agencies all with their own uh, assistance programs or what's worse and used to drive me nuts in AID, an earthquake would happen somewhere and uh, to a middle income country and the Roads Commission, whatever that is, and the US government would go out there and meet with the government and say, we're gonna rebuild all your roads. Not to worry, and the country would say, well, that's great, thanks. Then they'd come to AID, and of course, we, they'd say, we don't have any money, because we don't do international stuff. So we designed this, it's great, now fund it. And we said, that doesn't work that way, and it ain't gonna happen. So you have um, a lot of federal agencies, it's, it's sexy to be involved in international, whether it's disaster or international assistance, everybody wants to do it, and it's an art and a science, you gotta understand it. You can't build roads in Kentucky and think, well, you know, <laughs> let's go to Guatemala. We can, we can fix things there. So it's, depending on who's writing all this stuff, you get very weird, weird perspectives. So you gotta take it all with a bit of a grain of salt, and it does, it is really important to look at the folks who are contributing and writing this thing, and, and, and their background, and you will see certain trends about what they think ought to happen to development assistance, humanitarian assistance, and all this sort of stuff. So you, you, I guess my bottom line is you gotta read everything that's out there and then uh, don't take any of it too seriously and come up with your own approach. Up here. Thank you for coming here. My name is Shuni, I'm from China. Now I'm a first year student at a Master of Science in Foreign Service in Georgetown University. And I will study international development as my future concentration. Um, so my question is more about, uh, you mentioned about democracy like uh, uh, with the foreign assistance. So uh, I'm curious about like, is that always like promoting democracy and building like democr democratic institutions in those like fragile states, uh, one of the goal for like foreign assistance? Uh, also, if the answer is yes, I want to know some like, do you meet, like, see any failure cases, like bringing democracy into those like, fragile states and actually um, deteriorate those like, fragile states and kind of uh, accelerate their rights to becoming like failure states? Uh, so that's my question. Thank you. Well, we got, a, we got about four hours to answer that question, I think. It's a very good question and very important question. And perhaps we had a, uh, what do we mean by democracy? And it's interesting when, uh, when we were in Iraq writing the plan, and there's a lot of criticism given to Jerry Brimmer about bringing democracy there. But if you actually go back and look at the documents, what we actually said in them was a representative form of government. 
representative form of government? Are we talking about Jeffersonian democracy uh, from the very beginning? No, because it's, it can't happen. I mean, look at even look at this country. It took us how many years, and some would say we're even still working on it, and are we a true democracy? I mean, so you, you use D in the little d sort of sense. Uh, but we do believe, we do believe, that the people have a right and a vote, and they ought to you know, they ought to have a representative form of government and they get involved. Now, the challenge is when you have a democracy and people vote, they don't necessarily bring into office the people that you want in the office. And you go, oh, wow. Then what do you do? Okay. And policymakers have to think about that, you know. But I think we think you know, in terms of economic development and getting people involved in their country and making those decisions and building resiliency and coming up with solutions to the problems in their country, they ought to have a voice in that. Now, there is no doubt, I mean, when you look at the case studies about, for example, bringing democracy into Eastern, East Central Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union, it's complicated, you know, and people who have been in power and the elites don't want to give up that power for whatever reason. You know, be it economic, I talked about Milosevic, he certainly didn't want to give up power, neither did Karadzic. But so there is a corruption aspect of it, an econ aspect of it. But there's also a power base. And do you have the capabilities and have you built the capabilities within a country uh, so that they can carry out those services within the country? We talk about human capital and development. We also have a debate about do we have civil society organizations within those countries where the citizens can organize and express their needs? Do they have a mechanism? And then can the government respond to those? If you build civil society too quickly and you give them a voice, but the government can't deliver on, those, on that voice, then you have a huge expectation gap there, which leads to conflict, okay? So to say it's easy, no, it's not easy, but you got to make a start at it and you got to try uh, because we believe that people in those countries ought to have a voice. That's a very simplistic answer to an extremely complicated question. Uh, my mind full of Uh, hi, thank you for being here. My name is Lee Ratson. I'm a student at the Elliott School of, at GW. Um, could you speak a little bit about how USAID, um, USAID navigates uh, giving humanitarian aid in areas that are, and you touched on this before, that are hostile to its presence, but especially if a, if a people that we're trying to help is under the rule of a uh, someone we don't agree with, like a dictator or something like that, and, how do, and, and do we go in and how do you navigate that? I'm thinking especially um, in Syria, which sure. is under the rule of yeah. Bashar al-Assad. No, 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 it's a very good question, and it's a very key question, and one that we work on pretty hard. Uh, we do humanitarian assistance based on need. That was certainly the policy when I was in office. I assume it still is today. Um, we, and I can give you an example. When I was in office, we gave food aid to North Korea not exactly one of our allies. Uh, we gave food aid to Zimbabwe, okay? Uh, not exactly one of our allies, and we gave food aid to Myanmar uh, and did disaster response there. It's based on need, okay? But what you've gotta do is then put the structures into place to ensure that the food assistance or the disaster assistance gets to the people in need, those who are the most needy. Uh, so you don't give it to the government to distribute, okay? Uh, one of the things that we did when we went, uh, we had a consortium of NGOs that worked in North Korea and with WFP, two separate groups that we negotiated with the North Koreans on. One of the stipulations was we would bring in our own translators because in the past when we did food aid, uh, they would supply us with translators. <clears throat> um, so we said, thank you very much, but no, we're... One of the stipulations on the food aid is we would bring in our own translators. Um, they violated that uh, with one of those constituencies. Uh, the team came to me and uh, said, okay, we'll turn around the ships. 
uh, the North Koreans saw the ships turning around and said, well, maybe we'll reconsider and you can bring your own translators. So you've got to do things to make sure that, and is it 100%? No. I would be lying to you if I said I was. But it's, it's fascinating what you can do in terms of bringing assistance from the American people and showing that the American people care about a country like, for example, I don't know if you've known, see, ever seen a veg oil can, vegetable oil. Uh, on the side of it, it says it's got the big USAID symbol and from the American people. And what we noticed was happening in North Korea is after they used the veg oil, they would keep the cans and line their shacks with it. And so you would, you would go by these villages and you would see from the American people uh, on the side of it, which, which, which is always kind of an interesting statement too. So yeah, you've got to do it based on need, but you've got to put, you've got to put conditions in place to in, try to ensure that the food gets to the most needy. 